Good afternoon. I'm Elder Dana C. Edmond. I'm the Executive Director for the Office of Regional Conference Ministries. It's my privilege to welcome you into first another First Sabbath broadcast. We begin this program with very sad news by now. Most of you or many of you have heard of the passing of Elder Daniel R. Jackson, the former president of the North American Division, a good friend of ours, a good friend of regional conferences, who was actually on the very first uh, broadcast we did on Sabbath when we started this series off some two years ago. Um, we express our deep condol deepest condolences to his wife, Donna, another friend of regional conferences, past uh, Elder Jackson, only recently retired um, and then went to went re returned home to Canada uh, and and fell sick and passed away this morning. Um, and so um, as I said, we we, ex we express our our deepest condolences to his wife Donna. Oh just a wonderful person. Um, um, when he, when he left the presidency, I, I sent him a letter and I said, um, there are the brothers and the brethren. And I said, you are a brother. And he wrote back and he told me how much he appreciated um, the fact that even though he didn't look like us, um, he we, we claimed him as our own. And we are just, any all of us who knew him in, in regional conference, leadership loved him and are deeply saddened by his past. All right, let's move on to our first Sabbath broadcast. We've been away for a while because of camp meeting and general conference. Uh, and so even though this is not the first Sabbath, it was the first Sabbath that we could have it on. And we have a, a interesting program lined up for you today. So let's get right to it. Um, we will ask, um, um, we will ask uh, Mrs. Campbell. But before I do that, I, I, please allow me to acknowledge the presence of my co-hosts, two of my very, very, very favorite uh, young adults, um, Ms. Courtney, Mrs. Courtney Campbell, a church school teacher uh, at F.H. Jenkins Prep in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, who happens to be my daughter, and Ms. Rebecca Bell Jackson, who is my adopted daughter and who is uh, a doctoral de degree candidate at Howard University. Both these ladies are graduates of Oakwood product of Christian education, educators, which means your summer vacation is about to be over. Uh, thank you ladies for joining us. Ms. Campbell, would you pray for us please? Yes, I will. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so much that we are back. Lord, we thank you that we are back together here to talk about the work that you are doing through out your 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 work using your workers specifically here in the um, retirement program where we lift up the family of elder jackson we ask that you would send them comfort and lord we ask that you guide our words as we continue as we have this discussion together in your name we pray and thank you amen amen miss jackson who do we have with us today so today, um, our first guest is Dr. William Cox, who is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, 
and is married to the former Latonya Hoffman of Dayton, Ohio. They have three children and eight grandchildren. Dr. Cox is a graduate of Oakwood College and Andrews University, and he pastored in several conferences, including the Southern California Conference, Allegheny West Conference, the Southwest Region Conference, and he is the former president of Allegheny West. He is currently the executive director for Regional Conference Retirement Plan. And so we welcome you, Dr. Cox. Thank you. It is a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you please introduce the members of your staff who have joined us today? Okay. Um, I'm happy and delighted to do that. Uh, the first person I want to introduce is uh, Miss Elaine Austin. Uh, she is our uh, assistant uh, director. She's also um, the office manager and a classmate. Um, then there is uh, Yvonne Collins. Uh, Yvonne is the CFO for the Regional Conference Retirement Plan. She's also the head of our uh, department for um, making sure things go right uh, in our um, office. And then we have uh, Dr. Uh, Delbert uh, Baker. Uh, Dr. Baker um, recently uh, joined us as the uh, director for research and development. He is highly qualified to do that, and we are just delighted to have him as a part of our team. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cox. I neglected to say that today's program is about, is a continuing, it's a part of a continuing series on Black Seventh day Adventist institutions. That series started with. Um, Oakwood University with Dr. Pollard, which was actually our last program before the camp meeting general conference break. Uh, and today we're talking about the regional conference retirement plan. And let's get started with that discussion. Thank you, Elder Edman. Um, Dr. Cox, I know a lot of people are curious or have questions about how the regional conference retirement plan even came into being. Can you give us a little background on that? Okay. Uh, in the mid nineties, um, as a North American division was addressing its sustentation plan, which was a retirement plan for the North American division. Um, they realized that they had a, a significant deficit and they decided to move from a defined benefit program where the organization was re responsible for retirement to a defined contribution plan where the retiree receives funds from the organization. They are responsible for investing those funds and that became their uh, retirement. Well, regional conferences, the name itself has two major me uh, meanings. One, it, it deals with well, the fact regional of ethnicity is the name that uh, enabled us, uh, the nine regional uh, conferences to cover large uh, territories. Um, the, the term regional conference also means um, multiple territories. So you have state conferences that are in essence regional conference, such as Arkansas, Louisiana, because it covers two states. Uh, Texaco, it covers uh, part of Texas and a part of uh, Oklahoma. Well, the reality is because the nine regional conferences covered large territories. Often the spouses of our retirees would not have enough time in a specific location to actually become vetted in a retirement uh, plan. And so the regional conference leaders actually decided that we wanted to make sure that our regional conference workers were able to retire with dignity. And that was the major focus 
for the development of the regional conference retirement plan. All right, thank you, Dr. Cox. Tell, t- let's talk about your personal journey. Um, how did you end up being the executive director? What's the process that's involved in becoming uh, the executive director? And kind of tell us, what, what, what does the executive director do? Okay, so the, the process uh, is based upon how the regional conference uh, leadership and board is set up. Uh, there are actually 31 members on the regional uh, conference board. 27 of them come from the three officers of the three regional conferences, president, secretary, and um, to the nine regional conferences. Thank you. Um, and so uh, those 27 plus the executive director, the assistant director, the CFO, and the director from ORCM makes up that board. Well, when Elder McCoy um, um, was reaching a retirement uh, commitment, the board set up a search uh, committee to actually do an interview uh, for individuals who wanted to uh, follow Elder McCoy as executive director. Uh, I went through that uh, process with a number of other uh, candidates, um, went in, interviewed, and because um, uh, that group then made a recommendation um, to the board, and as a result, that person became the executive um, director. in terms of my involvement with uh, regional conferences, I was actually in Los Angeles at the time um, that the discussion began to uh, heat up. I want to thank uh, my president, um, uh, Elder Willie Lewis from Allegheny West Conference. He, he came to Los Angeles, offered uh, a position at the Ephesus Church in Columbus because of conversation I'd had with my wife that said that if we ever had a chance to um, be in close proximity to her parents that uh, resided in Dayton, uh, we would seek to take that call. And so when the offer was made, it was checkmate. I went to uh, Allegheny uh, West Conference and uh, we were able to actually get into the plan that officially started January 1 of 2000, and the rest is history. What do I do? Um, I I primarily uh, have the responsibility of setting the vision and the direction for the regional uh, conference plan along with um, the uh, office staff. We talk through it. Um, The board ultimately has the final say in terms of what we do and how we do it. Okay, forgive me for interrupting, uh, because I forgot I'd ask you a part two of that question. Uh, Providentially, uh, I believe uh, the Lord was in that call, because if I'm remembering correctly, when you all came back to Ohio, your wife's mother, who was not an Adventist, uh, joined joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, church. and so that call was providential. All right, let's find out a little bit about the other members of the staff. Miss Mrs. Collins, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to uh, the regional conference retirement plan. And we're going to call. You'll hear us periodically in, in the audience. You'll hear us call it the program RCRP. Uh, that's regional conference retirement plan for short. All right. So, Miss Mrs. Yvonne, tell us a little bit about yourself little bio, and then tell us how you ended up at RCRP. Thank you, Elder Edmund, and I want to say greetings to the saints. Um, Yvonne Collins migrated from Montego Bay, Jamaica, the lovely island of Jamaica, rich in soil. I came to the United States in 1976, working corporate, and I recall going to the New Orleans, make it real short, going to the New Orleans East Church, and when I went to the church, the church was almost like broken down. So I decided to say, hey, we got to fix this church. I mean, you know, there's no way we have to fix this church. 
So they say, oh, we have to go to the Southwest Region Conference for funding. I didn't understand the dynamics. So therefore, I went there for funding, and immediately they pulled me in to work with the finance department for Southwest Region Conference. And then thereafter, I was elected as a women's ministry director. While I work in corporate, um, Dr. Theodore Brown um, was called to be the treasurer of the Great Lake Region Conference. So he asked me if I would join him. And I was like, um, I don't want to work for the church. I mean, absolutely not. I don't mind volunteer, but the church doesn't pay me kind of money for me to work for the church. And he said, come on, you have everything you need, please. And with I asked my husband, who is retired from Shell Oil, and he said, if that's where the Lord lead, I'll go wherever you go. So I went to the Lake Region Conference to serve in the capacity as treasurer there for 16 years. And then um, there, um, Phyllis Wehrle, shout out to Phyllis, was the treasurer for the RCRCP and ORCM. And um, either the department decided that we're going to split, have two different um, chief financial officers due to the growth of the um, retirement plan. And I was interviewed and accepted the job. So here I am in Huntsville living the life of luxury in the lovely mm -hmm. Alabama area, which I love dearly. Okay, thank you, Ms. Collins. Same question to you, Ms. Austin, and you, Dr. Baker, in that order. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I'll blame my journey here on my orthodontist. I was not an Adventist. I was born and raised in the Baptist church, and uh, it was time to go to high school. And so my mother mentioned to my orthodontist, we were looking for a high school. She suggested Newberry Park Adventist Academy. I had never heard of Seven Day Adventist, had no, had no clue. We went, took a visit, I loved it, stayed in the uh, dormitory. And my senior year in high school, I got baptized into the Adventist church. In 1984, I moved to the Washington DC area after having attended, um, well, attended Oakwood, graduated in 82, went back home. And then in 84, I moved to the Washington DC area and uh, picked up a hobby of decorating cakes. And I had lost my job at the time because they decided to relocate to Atlanta and I didn't want to move since I just moved to DC. And Tim McDonald, who worked at the Columbia Union Conference office, the education superintendent, also went to Brinklow, the church I was at, and he knew that I decorated cakes, asked me to do cakes for his teacher's picnic. And I had to do 12 sheet cakes. And in the course of picking them up and talking to me, he says, what are you doing? I said, well, doing nothing now, looking for a job. He says, well, I think we have an opening at Columbia Union Conference. So in 1986, I started working at Columbia Union Conference with the HHES department in customer service. Stayed there till 1994 when I got married, uh, moved to Hampton, Virginia, where my husband, Tim, was. And then in 1998, Dr. Baker called us both to come to Oakwood College at the time to work. And I stayed there for four years, uh, two years with Dr. Baker, and then actually wound up working with Dr. McDonald in IT until 2002. And then Elder McCoy called me and asked me would I be interested in coming to work to the regional office. Had never heard of the regional office. He said, you'll be working with Elder Frank Jones. I knew Elder Jones from Brinko and started there in 2002. And in 2009, I was promoted to assistant director. And here I am still 20 years later. All right. All right. Dr. Baker, tell us about Sure, sure, sure. I, I want to give greetings to everyone as well and to join in by sharing our story of Providence that brought us here together with this dynamic team. I've, I've had several decades in ministry, everything from the pastor in Allegheny West to Message Magazine to Loma Linda, uh, 14 years at Oakwood, five years at the General Conference, and five years uh, in Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, at the Adventist University of Africa. Well, when I came home, I, I was through with administration. I chose not to do anything in uh, administration or really, for that matter, in education. So when this possibility developed uh, with Dr. Cox, who had a vision for expanding the ministry uh, to retirees, matching with my love for retirees and my love to work and educate and develop and write, it was a match made in heaven. And so I happily agreed, uh, thanks to the regional leadership and the team here. And that brings me here to the retirement program. I've always had a deep love for retirees in all of the aspects of my work. And so now having the chance to minister and to really provide services uh, with this team is just God's providence. 
Thank you for sharing, Dr. Baker. Um, Ms. Austin, how many people are currently on the regional conference retirement plan? My mom is. <laughs> and are all the recipients of RCRP former employees? As of December last year, we had 835. They are retirees and beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are people who are either the spouse or children. It can be another you know, person, could be a sibling as well, that are benefiting because the worker actually passed away. So we had 835 as of December, and we have processed as of today 44 new applications. So that's a total currently of 879. So I have a follow-up question about how many people on average begin receiving benefits every year? Okay, I went back for two and a half years. In 2020, we processed 52 applications. Last year in 2021, we processed 57. And to date this year, we've processed 44. So we'll definitely be well over that 57 from last year. Thank you, Ms. Austin. Um, Dr. Baker, as has been mentioned many times, you have a background at Oakwood. You were my president when I attended Oakwood, and now you are the director, research and development director. What is involved in that particular aspect of your job? Uh, well, that's an exciting, exciting question because it allows me to share that uh, the uniqueness about the RC, the RC RP program is it's moving into an area that a lot of retirement programs don't deal with, and that is providing additional services for the retirees. So the research and development area opens us up to deal with strategies, ministries, services, uh, focus groups, understanding what are the retirees really dealing with, what are their needs, what are their interests, and then we can go back as a team, look at it and say, what can we do uh, to offer more services uh, for our retirees to get ready for retirement? Uh, before they actually enter the retirement phase, the transition in, and then once they're in the retirement program, how can they maximize their potential? We see this being a great opportunity to develop great services with retirees. A lot of people, when they retire, they feel like I'm just sitting back and I'm going to the beach and you know kick back and, and take it easy and do nothing. On the other hand, uh, many, the new retirement thinking says there's great things we can do. And this is an exciting chapter of our life. And so in research and development, along with the team here, we're saying, how can we maximize this potential and just open it up for our retirees? So we do publications and programs. You'll be hearing about another program later on and a variety of things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, Ms. Alston, who is covered by RCRP? And how can I, I mean, how can a person become eligible to receive benefits? Anyone working for one of the nine regional conferences in our office who's a full-time or even we now have part-time employees is eligible to be on the plan. However, is let's say we hired you tomorrow, you have to work a thousand hours, straight hours. So if we hired you July of 2022, in between July of 2023, you would have had to work a thousand hours to be eligible. If we hire you at age 55 or older, then you're automatically what we call vested. And vested means you're immediately ready for uh, eligible for retirement benefits. Those who start and, and meet that thousand hour uh, rule, when they work five years, then they become vested on our plan. Now to back up a little bit, when we started our plan, which was January 1, 2000, Anyone working for a regional conference January 1, 2000, who did not sign a waiver to stay with the North American Division Retirement Plan, we had about maybe eight people that did, then all of their vested and approved NAD years carried over into the regional plan. All right. Well, Ms. Jackson, I noticed you, you used the word I. How can I become a part? You know, I've been trying to get you to be, to be connected with the nominational service for a long time. So you, we can talk, we, we, we can talk about that. Uh, we can talk about that, that, that later. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Um, Ms. Ms. Collins, let's talk about, and by the way, I forgot to say this at the beginning, um, and I'll ask Mrs. Mrs. Campbell, Ms. Jackson to help me with this. If there are questions from the audience, please put them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Ms. Collins, um, Ms. Jackson expressed an interest in, in being a part of uh, being a part of RCRP so how how much does, how much is that going to cost Ms. Jackson to be a, to be a part or any or any employee how, how much does it cost let me address the beautiful Ms. Jackson <laughs> oh, but thank you um, elder Edmund for the lovely question there I want to share with this audience that to be a part of the retirement, all you have to do is to work for the great yeah. regional conferences. The nine out of the nine regional conferences. This is not a contribution where you have to contribute anything. This is a benefit that we believe in. The, the workers of our conferences desire to work and retire in style. So they don't have to come up with anything however. The conferences, the constituency, they put contribution into the conference and the conferences send that contribution, which is 9%, it's 10.25% is broken down to the regional conference headquarters. So each conference contributes 10.25%. Uh, Okay, so when I was in South Central, the tithe was up a little over 20, it's about 22, 22, 23 million dollars. So that's a little over two million dollars. That's correct. Okay, very good. Um, and it's important to know, Elder Edmund, that from that contribution come down, you know, we know we're building a lovely building, and people say, Well, but that's not retirement. It's important to know that that is not retirement fund. That is building the building. That's very important to know as a CFO to share with the audience. All right. Yeah. When you send your retirement, it's strictly for retirement. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because there, there was that misconception. Yes. And one of our next programs, we're going to talk about it later, will be from our beautiful uh, um, ORCM, RCRP, Breath of Life office complex uh, that'll we'll talk about that in a little while and so it's very i'm glad thank you for sharing that because there were people who were saying you're taking my retirement funds to build that building thank you for telling us that that is not the case well miss jackson as a person who is entering year five being employed by the regional conferences. I say, come on aboard. I'm very excited at what I'm hearing, not just as one of the co-hosts, but as a member of the regional conference retirement plan. Um, Dr. Cox, my next question is for you. Can you tell us your vision for the RCRP and for the retirees as well? Well, uh, yes. And what I want to say to you, Courtney, we are just delighted to have you. Um, <laughs> you are family. And so yeah. as a result, uh, we are excited about the fact that um, you will be vetted as of, of this year. Um, the um, uh, vision for retirement really can be summed up in the acronym CROF. Uh, it's, it's what we are seeking to uh, accomplish. Um, the C stands for number one, customer service. We, we are committed to fostering and to nurturing and to satisfying our members and the beneficiaries um, by taking care of their needs in a very professional and customer service friendly way. And um, we believe that we can be a world-class organization. The Aura stands for retirement uh, readiness. You'd be surprised how many individuals are not really ready for retirement. They're not ready for retirement from a financial perspective. They're not ready for retirement from an emotional uh, perspective. They, they're not 
ready for the disconnect. Today you are, tomorrow you are not. Uh, there are benefits that come to individuals who are a part of the organization. We don't uh, transition uh, life insurance or, or death insurance um, at retirement time. And so um, the, the vision is retirement uh, readiness. We want to make sure those who are pre and post retirement move in, into retirement uh, successfully. The O stands for operational competence. Um, that is that we want to use um, uh, our commitment uh, to the effectiveness and the efficiency of how we uh, operate. Uh, we look at best practices. Um, we are not static in this process. We, we can have been doing things for years, but if there is a better way to do it, something that is going to be more uh, profitable to our retirees, which is our number one commitment, we are willing to change. And so that takes care of the O. And then finally, uh, financial uh, health. That's the F at the end of Croft. Financial okay. health has to start before a person actually retires. So we are going through the process now of teaching them what is necessary for you to prepare for retirement. You just can't go into it and think everything is going to uh, be all right. And so we want to make sure that our workers like yourself, who will be uh, newly vested into our uh, program, that we talk to you now about preparing for um, the for your retirement age if the Lord happens to delay it, his coming. We share with individuals, God did say, occupy until he comes. And it's our goal, our desire to make sure that all of our retirees and benefits are able to retire with dignity and to move forward in their golden age to doing that which God has placed on their hearts. Mrs. Campbell, I'm glad to hear that you are that you will be vested this year in the retirement <laughs> program. However, you know you are old when your daughter is vested <laughs> in the retirement program. Just vested, not retiring yet. Oh, no, no, no. No. You got some space there. Got some space. Got some space. You're seasoned, okay. Elder. You're seasoned. Not season. old. You're seasoned. Season. You know, that's what we, when I was young, when I was Miss Rebecca's pastor in Memphis, we used to say old people were seasoned because we didn't want to say they were old. So that, I, I, I know all those little, I know all those little, uh, uh, all those other little ways of saying somebody's old, but praise the Lord for getting old because the alternative is not very good. All right, let's, let's, go, let's go on. Dr. Baker, you, you alluded to um, a program because uh, Dr. Uh, I've heard my, my, my very good friend, Dr. Uh, Cox say many times his goal is to, for the retirees to get more than a check. And you you alluded earlier to the fact that this is unlike uh, our program is unlike a lot of programs that just hand people a check. OK, so you alluded to another program. Uh, t t tell us about a Dale. I think it is. Tell us what it is. Um, yeah, yeah, just 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 talk to us about the Adele program. Well, great. I, I want to build on the words of uh, Dr. Cox and talk about the vision for this program. I, I want to affirm what my colleagues have said. And the 20 years the RCRP program has been in existence, I am so proud of what happened. It started to happen in 2000. I remember very distinctly when the moves were underway uh, to create this program. And from the start to now, it's been a tremendous blessing. Well, part of the vision that you just heard mentioned was that there be a ministering avenue of the retirement program. Now, there's nothing wrong with just the check. I mean, everybody affirms that you got to have that check. 
for sure. But on top of that is how can we work with the retirees who've given literally tens of thousands of hours of ministry? How can we help them when they move into the retirement area to feel a part of a whole, to have a community, uh, to feel like they still can use their resources, they can stay in touch, they can have continuing education, they can learn, they can have the resources, and on and on and on. Well, as a result of this, uh, with uh, Dr. Cox, uh, Elaine, Yvonne, the Board of Trustees, you, Elder Edmund, and many others, uh, the program ADEL has come into existence. It stands for Association for Development, Enrichment, and Lifelong Learning. It is the ministering avenue of RCRP that allows many of the services uh, that retirement, the retirees can be blessed from. You say, well, what are those services? Well, when we started it, uh, really the end of last year, the question was, what do we need to have in this program? So we did a series of research groups with the retirees. We had about 12 focus groups, surveys, focus groups, a variety of ways meeting with people saying, what do you want? And they came up with about seven or eight areas that were crucial that they wanted uh, the retirement fund to assist them with. Uh, they have they have to do, I'll just give a couple. Uh, finance is very big, you know, how, how to get ready for retirement, how to prepare for it. What do you do when you get in retirement? Uh, Health care was another big thing. Another one was uh, dealing with family members and loved ones. Dealing with grief and loss was another area. Uh, another area that was focused was how do you keep learning and keep developing in the retiree area? Well, ADEL, the Association for Development, Enrichment, Lifelong Learning, has the goal and purpose of providing resources in all these areas. So in short, it has to do online. We have an the website, if you go to the RCRP website, it is chock full of resources and documents for everyone. Then the ADEL program has with that special areas in the area of social development, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, and caregiving. Uh, these six areas we have background programs, resources in that you can get free of charge to be a part of. And then every month we have what we call, get this, it's called AMP, A-M-P. Very simple, it's ADEL monthly program. And every month starting in June, we had programs and then July and then August is coming up. Uh, like for example, uh, this month we had Elder Palmer. Uh, last month we had uh, Dr. Cox. They had a five minute devotion. And then following that, we had a mini concert. The well, first June was, was Whitley Phipps. And this month we had the Josiah family here in the Washington DC area. Uh, and then we had Susan Baker of PT spoke on helpful tips for the home. And then uh, this month, we have the Olivers on retirement and the family. Well, next month, you know, look out for this. We have a very rich program coming up. Elder Edmund is giving the, uh, the devotional. And then we have after that, John Stoddard has a concert, only 20 minutes, five minutes for the devotion, concert 20 minutes. And then the workshop is by Dr. Paul Anderson. And he's talking about dealing with grief and transition and retirement. So each month, these resources will be added to the ADEL program online. Now, somebody, as I'm wrapping up my comments, somebody may ask, well, how do you, how am I a part of ADEL? Is it only for regional retirements or retirees? And the answer, uh, Dr. Cox knows as well, the vote by uh, the administration as the board, no. This is for any retiree that wants to be a part of it. Now, surely the primary focus is regional retirees, but it's for anyone. Uh, you can be retired or not retired. The only way you'd sign up is you simply, uh, when you get the app or you go online, you put your name, your email address, and your phone number, and you are a part of ADEL. Every month you'll get the app and you'll get the resources and you will be blessed by it. Uh, the last thing, and Dr. Cox, I don't know if, you, if, you want, uh, if you're going to mention this, but there is a program uh, that has been discussed. It's, it's due to come up at the end of the year, and that is, I think, it was Courtney or, or Rebecca mentioned something about if you're younger, you're not in retirement program now, what do you do? Uh, there is what's called a REAP program. It's Retirement Education Acceleration Program. And that's information on how to get ready for retirement. So listen about that in the future. In the meantime, the new Regional Voice magazine has a lot of information in there on the retirement program, new retirement thinking. Uh, our listeners may want to check that out. You'll be enriched. Thank you. Dr. Baker, don't forget to mention the free gift that individuals get just for signing up. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, one of the areas in the research development, we produced our first publication with RCRP Adel. It's called 101 Retirement Challenges, Spiritual Insights. It's 200 plus pages. It's an online ebook. When you sign up for it, when you give your email and phone number, uh, you automatically can download this free retirement book, and I know you'll be blessed by it. Dr. Baker, just to confirm a follow-up question about Adele. So if you are not currently involved, you said that there's a link online. Is there a website you'd like to share or is this app in the Apple store, the Google store? Well, all you have to really do is go to the RCRP website. If you go regionalretirement.org, that's one way to go to it, regionalretirement.org or adele.today. Either one of those will get you to the website and you go there. When you go to the website, there'll be a little coupon that's dropped down and says, here's a chance to sign up. You sign up for it and automatically you can get the gift book that Dr. Cox is referring to uh, and you'll be a part of Adele once you sign up. It's very simple, no involvement, no money. It's a service provided by RCRP free of charge for any interested person, regardless of your background, regardless if you're part of the retirement program or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Collins, you mentioned that previously there was one position as in terms of chief financial officer, and now both RCRP and ORCM have a separate CFO. Why is that? Ms. Collins, you're on mute. Thank you, Sister Candler, for that question. Because of the growth of RCRCP, the retirement office, we um, come, into the con come into the office in Huntsville. I think they just had Elaine, Phyllis, and Brother Pastor McCoy, Elder McCoy. Now, as you can see, we have nine employees there at the conference office. But the regional retirement plan itself has grown so vastly that now we have to have two chief financial officers. Um, Dr. Margaret Nichols as the chief financial officer, um, that works close with Elder Edmund, and I work close to with Elder Cox. So, and not just another thing I want to share, we handle the, the processing section. The funds that for the retirement office doesn't come to the Huntsville office. That go directly to the retirement office, which is Mutual of America. That's very important to know. So we don't co-mingle those funds. But the work is so vast now that you have to have Two, and I know Phyllis did a wonderful job as one, but we had to have a second. Really, we need a third person, to be honest with you. There's a lot of work there to be done. All right. Um, I want to thank our producer, Pastor Barone Savori. He's, he's, he's stuck in the at the bottom of the screen. And I, I'm really hopeful that our retirees who have not taken advantage of the Adele program, because I think, I think we have maybe about 400 people or so that we've, we've been able to reach out to on about the Adele program sure. where we have, we have like 800 people on the plan. So only about half of the people have become aware so far of this very fine program. So if you're, if you're, if you're a retiree from RCRP and you're not involved in Adele, um, thank you. We thank Brother Pastor Zavori for uh, putting that at the bottom of the screen. So please take note of that. Or if you want to, you want to copy it for somebody else. Uh, please let them know this. It's a great program, and uh, we want you to take advantage. Of it. All right, um, Mrs. Austin, you you told us you started way back in the, in the. I want to say the turn of the turn of the century because that makes you sound, that makes it sound really bad, but it actually was the turn of the new century. Um, kind of, kind of when when our, when we are fully staffed, uh, counting the volunteer, we have like a uh, we have like eleven. We have nine now, but when we're fully staffed, we have eleven people. We didn't start off that way, so kind of take us back uh, uh, to Frank Jones, who was the he was ORCM. RCRP, he was everything, and and it was you and him. So, kind of tell us what what, right, what that right. was like. Well, when we when we, when when we first started down this road, what was it like? 
Elder Jones was a North American division retiree. He and Dorothy, his wife, retired to Huntsville, and they asked him to help out uh, getting the office organized. I know he used to help out at the Oakwood Church and even at Oakwood, helping with various buildings. And so when I came, it was just Elder Jones. He had a student worker that came in a couple hours a day, and um, everything was on his desk. At that time, I think we hadn't started really processing applications yet, about the next year. I think we may have had two or three and everything was sitting on his desk or in his desk drawer. So I got him organized. I got the applications off of his desk into my desk. And um, Elder Jones was a servant leader. There was nothing beneath him, nothing he would not do. Um, If he needed to cut the grass, he'd take his tie off, roll up his sleeves. He was out there cutting the grass. If we were stuffing envelopes, he'd sit there with me and stuff envelopes, take them to the post office. I remember when we finally got all of the waivers, um, I mentioned earlier, there were about eight or nine people that waived out in state with North American Division. Well, everyone who stayed on the regional plan had to also sign a waiver and their spouses had to sign the form. And Elder Jones would not put them in the mail. He carried a stack that was huge, something like that got on the plane and personally delivered it to the North American division because he did not want anything to happen to that stack. Um, There were always stories, those of you who knew him, his way of cussing in vegetarian terms, if he called you a bird or them birds, that was his way. Uh, Every day, every morning was a story. It was a joy to work with him and and such a a tragic loss when when he passed away. But um, it was just just the two of us. But we did it. <laughs> we tell us about your little house on the prairie. Yes, yes. <laughs> that house, uh, uh, from what I understand, Oakwood University gave us that house, and for a dollar a year for ninety nine oh. years, and I don't think we ever paid one dollar to ne- be. We never paid the dollar. <laughs> you all, you guys need to pay your debts. <laughs> <laughs> right, Oakwood, a check. We, we so appreciated that house. Uh, Elder Jones did the work to, to get it renovated and put um, um, what do you call it? office equipment, supplies and whatnot in it. Um, it was a little small house. We didn't have, even though we had telephones with intercoms, Elder McCoy used to joke, we would just sit in our office. Hey, Elder Jones, Elder McCoy, just yell down the hall. You didn't have to get up. It was so small and quaint. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, we had a fire. Um, I forgot what year it is. I think it was 2016, if I'm not mistaken. We had a fire. Uh, we had to leave the little house, as Elder McCoy liked to call it, a little house on the prairie. And uh, we wound up where we are now, renting off of Millennium Drive and soon to move into our own building. It is a measure Amen. of how the Lord has blessed that we moved from the little house on the prairie to, the to big house. another to the big house. That's right. Rented quarters on Millennial Drive so to sometime next month. Uh, <laughs> the project is nine months late, but sometime next month we right. we right. plan to move into a two-story, thirty-two thousand square foot, nine million dollar structure for which we will owe nothing. Somebody ought to say, "Amen, amen." amen. Uh, it just shows how wonderfully. The Lord has blessed. And we have named the boardroom, the Frank Jones boardroom, after a a wonderful person. I just wish he could be around to see see it. We all have to to make sure we we are saved so we can tell him about it. (laughs) Um, It also, before we go on the next question, it also goes, it also goes to the very unique and special partnership that the regional conferences have with um, Oakwood. Um, Oakwood original, I think that was when you were there, Dr. Baker, sure. gave them the little house on the prairie That's for right. a dollar a, a year for 99 years, <laughs> uh, which they never paid. <laughs> uh, um, similarly, similarly, the land where we're building our building on is land that Dr. Pollard allowed our office to pick. Right. You know, he didn't just he didn't just he didn't just stick us in the corner somewhere, but he allowed our office to pick the spot. And it is prime property right across from the McKee building. And he also 
uh, is leasing that to us for a dollar a year for 99 years, and we're going to pay. <laughs> but we appreciate the, the partnership that exists between the, the regional conferences uh, put in several million. When I was president, I think it was six million. It may be more than that now. The regional conferences um, uh, contribute to Oakwood, and Oakwood um, recognizes the partnership that exists between regional conferences and our school. And we're very grateful for that. Okay. Uh, we, we Elder, Elder, yes. Elder, Elder Edmund, uh, we don't want to give kudos to everyone else and leave you out because you have been the person that has uh, organized and structured the, the process for our new building. And we are very appreciative. Um, that is a hard job. Yes, it is. And you have managed it with uh, great grace and dignity uh, as we have dealt with individuals outside of our organization. We have a good name primarily because of the way you've managed that process. And so I would not want this time to go by without saying thank you to you. You're very kind. Okay let's let's go on it, it was a four and a half year process and we're thankful that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and we hope to be able to begin moving uh, mrs collins is spearheading that process and we hope to begin be able to be, begin moving into our new building um next month uh, but it, okay let's let's we're, we're rounding third in this program so let's go let's uh let's continue Ms. Collins, this question is for you. So we've talked about the check that the beneficiaries mm -hmm. get every month. Um, we talked about Adele. Are there any other benefits that the RCRP retirees receive? Yes, they do. As a matter of fact, when an employee works for the regional work and they retire, they have what you call, it's called a retirement assessment. It's a percentage um, based on the North American Division uh, remuneration scale that is granted to them. And it based on the year of a service that they have served some 30 years. I've seen when individuals serve 30 years and have a fat check of over $25,000. So, you know, it's a great benefit. It's just great benefit to work for the retirement. I mean, the regional conferences, you know, when you retire. It's really a, an assessment. And I, ne I never forget when I went work for the conference, I said, why do they get this money when it's just a benefit just to say thank you on top of the retirement funds that they receive? Also, we um, work along with the Adventist Risk Management for those individuals who cannot get um, medical insurance outside on the field. Uh, we um, partnership with Adventist Risk. And if a retiree, a part with their uh, Medicare, part A and B, they can get a subsidy also for a premium, of course, with the retirement office. So I could say the retirement office that we have for the regional work if, is Stella, it's one of the top. I, I think also Ms. Collins can correct me if I'm wrong. And and I need to um, point out that there's a question in the chat. Ms. Ms. Campbell, I'm gonna ask you to read that question. But Ms. Ms. Collins, correct me if I'm wrong. If for whatever reason, um, I still have a school uh, children who are, and, and, and this probably happens. I have children who are in college as a retiree. Is, is there, isn't there educational benefit? Yes, it's educational subsidy. Also, mm -hmm. if a retiree of dependent children, we give $225 per month mm -hmm. for that retired depend for the dependent as well. Okay, wow. But you have okay. to be in, a, a, if you know, a lot of times we have to adopt our children, our grandchildren. So we also take care of not only the um, the medical portion, but also for schooling as well. All right. That's and just and to add to that, I'm sorry? No, I was gonna say, just to add to what she's saying, if they were covered by the conference five years prior to retirement, then we also cover them in retirement. Yes, yes. Wow. That's, it's a okay. blessing to know that so there's a lot of perks that go along with that. And we recently, um, um, and I'm sure Dr. Cox is going to cover that when a person uh, retires deceased, we also give some extra money to help for burial as well. 
So we really taking care of a lot of little nuances stuff. Or I'm just mm -hmm. saying nuances. I'm just saying those are good stuff to help with the burial. And and we need to point out that this is a result of of uh, the faithfulness of our constituents. They faithful need, of our constituency, uh, yes, sir. So we are, we we appreciate that a faithfulness that allowed regional conferences last year as it's when we were still in a pandemic to have what was probably the largest tide increase that we ever had. I think we did in spite of the pandemic doc, we had a great increase across the board yes. for that. And, you know, I got to give kudos to my boss, Dr. Cox, you know, because when he came on board also for the retiree, you know, when a retiree passed, the spouse was only getting up a six to six percent with Elder Cox leadership. They get a hundred percent now of what the retiree was getting. So that's a blessing. It is. It is. All right. The question from the from the audience, Mrs. Kim. Yes, we have a question from um, one of the people watching on YouTube, and we thank those of you who are watching. The question is, and I'm not sure who is um, able to answer it, so I'll just open this up to everyone. It says, can workers in the regional conference work in the Bermuda conference for a few years without losing service credit toward their retirement in the regional conference retirement plan? Oh, there it is on the screen. Thank you. Okay. I think the person asking that has a vested interest in the answer. That's my friend, Dr. Manners, who's the president of the Bermuda Conference. Let me direct that to Dr. Cox. Okay. So um, one, one of the things that I appreciate about our leadership is that we have learned from others um, missteps. So as an example, the North American um, Division on Retirement Plan was funded by the conferences. All 59 conferences paid into the retirement plan. And that was based upon um, you know, that everybody in a, a region, in a conference, one of the 59 conferences was sending a percentage of its tithe to the North American division. Okay. Well, the unions were putting individuals into the retirement plan, but not making financial contribution. And the North American division was putting individuals into the retirement plan and not making contribution. And the general conference was putting individuals into the retirement plan without making contributions. And so we learned from that. So you can only receive benefits for the time that you have served in the North American division if you were a an employee employee January 1 of 2000. So if, as an example, um, 96 to 98, I was in California, Southeastern California. That time is covered in our plan because I was a member of a regional conference January 1, 2000. After January 1, 2000, we do not accept uh, service credit from any other uh, groupings except the nine regional conferences and the Office of Regional Ministries, or if you're working for the retirement program in Huntsville. Okay, but Dr. Manders was saying, if I go to Bermuda, do I lose the time that I had before? Um, you do. No, not before. Yeah, not, okay. before not before. But while you are gone, you do not get service no, sure. credit. Right, if you right. come back, you can uh, pick up that uh, that time once you come back. Okay. Uh, the, in other words, the time that you come back and start working in a regional conference, that will add to your service credit. The time you spent in Bermuda does not add to your service credit. Right. Because I think back, I think once upon a time when you left, you there were certain circumstances where you just lost all that time. And I think that's 
that's what he was concerned about. So you you don't you don't add time, but you don't lose time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something to that, Miss Austin? As the yeah, person? I want to go back to the vesting. If they're not vested, let's say they worked for a regional conference two years and they go to Bermuda for five or ten years, and unfortunately they do lose that. But okay. if they're vested, if they're vested they go they to Bermuda, then their years are frozen with a regional plan. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that correction. I thought, Ms. Campbell, I thought I saw another question in chat. Did I do? Did I see a question in the chat? Elder Edmund, I need to make a correction to a statement I made earlier as well. Okay. Yes. I, I don't want ever want to go out and um, adopt children or so. It's You have to have work 30 years to get that 225. Okay. It's important to you for that correction. Okay. Okay. You have to Very retire good. in the system for 30 years before you get the 225 for the medical. Okay. Thank you Thank for you. that correction. Miss, I thought I saw a question in the chat. Yes, I believe there was another question, but I believe it came from Facebook okay. and I've been on YouTube. So I can okay. there there it is. Um, okay. um thank you. Okay. Um let's read the question. Congratulations on the creation of this retirement program that ensures our workers can retire in dignity. Is this program a um uh, defined, defined benefit to benefit or defined contribution program? Okay. Um, so um I think Ms. Collins, you addressed that, and I need to say that that question came from one of my former members in my very first church in the Virgin Islands. Shirley Late King. Uh, so Miss Miss Mrs. King, thank you for listening all the way from the beautiful island of St. Thomas. My regards to your husband Julio and all the Miss Miss Mrs. King was a teenager when I was there in St. Thomas, had a wonderful time. So Miss Miss Collins. Um, yeah, we do have a defined benefit, not a contribution. Okay, defined benefit program. Praise the Lord. Praise, yes, the, Lord. praise the Lord for that. Yes. yes. Not defined. Employees uh, don't have okay. To contribute. okay. Now we in the Adventist church, we tend to use a lot of acronyms and expressions. The Seventh-day Adventist church has its own vocabulary. So just so that nobody's, nobody's kind of left in the dark, help us understand the difference between Mrs. Collins, between defined define contribution and defined benefit. A very simple term. A contribution is when the employee contribute to the plan. And I think North American Division have both. They were original contribution. I think they recently switched over as well to define. So the regional retirement office have a define where you don't have to contribute nothing. Nevertheless, for those who are not qualified to be on the retirement, we have what you call a 403B. So that all no employee we get left behind. The 403B is a contribution where you contribute your own funds to that. And that's funds that you could withdraw at any time you see fit with a penalty, of course, but it's year funded. Okay, very good. Okay, last couple of questions. Um, this, I have a question for Dr. Baker, and you mentioned this, and so I, I'm very excited. Um, it's if I am a young person, I'm going to claim that I still am a young person and a young a youngish employee of the regional conferences. And um, with the way things are going in the world, it's unlikely, it, it does not look likely that we'll be on this earth long enough for me to retire. I'm gonna say I'm still that young to have that kind of up in the air. So what benefits do you have or, or what is the the draw for your, your employees who are not quite retirement age? And I know you mentioned a program that was targeted towards, I'm gonna say us, uh, can you give a little bit more background, a little more information on that? Well, as a younger person, I, I really applaud you for asking that question because many young people are not asking about the retirement years. They're thinking they're so far away. And like you said, maybe Jesus will come before I reach that point and they don't ask the question. Uh, they should. Every person should ask because there, there's that, what is that text in Luke 19, 13, uh, I call it OTIC, Occupy Till I Come. Everybody should do everything they can to prepare for tomorrow, even if tomorrow may not come. You know, we want wills. We want uh, pre-service needs. We want what's going to happen to us if something were to happen to me and uh, it were to fall on my three sons and so forth. I mean, so we, we got to do that. And so young people need to, need to ask that question, uh, uh, Courtney. And even in our re research, our retirement group, uh, focus groups, 
people said that same thing. They said, listen, you retirement people need to get out to colleges and universities and tell these young people they need to they need to really prepare early. Because if they start in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s, they will be way ahead of the game. And if Jesus doesn't come, uh, they're still ready and they still have their finances in order. So I, I would say it like that. Uh, yes, they need to prepare. There are things they can do. There's much literature they can read about this and get ready for retirement early. In fact, uh, in this article that's currently in the Regional Voice, this new retirement thinking, one a research program that was just conducted in the United States said most people said they regret the fact that they didn't start saving uh, in their 30s. They said if they started in 30s, they would have been way ahead but they waited until the 50s and then they got nervous. They said, let me rush and try to catch up. So the sooner, the better. So I, that's what I would say. But I want to say one real quick, two quick points. One, uh, joining with the others uh, as, as a love for history and having written a lot in the history line in the Black work. Uh, I want to join in with, with Dr. Cox and with others and to applaud the work that's being done now in the retirement program. And Elder Edmund, uh, he knows my thoughts on this. But uh, there are three great eras in the black work. In the 1940s, when it started, when the black conference was started, that was a wonderful thing. And then in 2000, when the regional conference retirement plan was initiated, that was another great era that was started. I believe now with the building of this, this incredible facility, debt-free, uh, making Oakwood just a part of Oakwood and Oakwood being a part of that, uh, it is a, it's almost like the third phase in the black work. I mean, this is, this is a historic moment uh, it will give great stability to the regional conference office of regional conference ministries, uh, the regional conference of retirement plan, and the bond between Oakwood and uh, this entity forever. And it should be noted that in that building is not simply uh, the retirement office and the regional conference ministries office, but you've got all the black entities. And this is the first time this has ever happened in our history. So I hope our listeners will understand the historicity of this and to say this is a great moment to witness. And so, Elder Edmund, I want to join with others. Uh, in that building, there's the, the Regional Conference Museum. Uh, that's going to be a lot of great things going on. So everybody, listeners, be aware of that. When it happens late in the year, you need to check that out. I want to end by saying this. Uh, Elaine referred to Elder Jones, one of the associate treasurers of the General Conference. When he joined this fund way back around 2000, he and Elder McCoy uh, and the regional conference presidents really deserve a great uh, just affirmation because that was a daring move then. It, it was a big deal. And these people who were there in the heat of the battle when it started, they kicked this thing off and all praise God, of course, and thanks to them for uh, for the work they did. You can go online, blacksdahistory.org if you want to learn all about Black Avenue's history. It's a wonderful website, blacksdahistory.org. And that's wonderful. I end with this. Everyone, right now we are in a pivotal demographic shift in the country. We are having net more retirees now than ever in the history of this country. In fact, since, since 2010, 2011, 10,000 persons are retiring every single day. So the figures, the demographics that Ms. Austin referred to earlier, they're going to continue and increase. So, so re retirement is a big thing. And now when people move into retirement, they're not kicking back doing nothing, but they will be active. And that is a wonderful force of service that society can take advantage of and maximize. So all of us need to be aware of this. Uh, the baby boomers getting older, they say in year 2030, 2030 and 2031, all the baby boomers, 76 million Americans, will have reached the point of retirement. So all these folks are coming in retirement and they're living longer. Uh, do you know that right now, uh, this is the more, most time in all history where people are living beyond 90 years of age. That's the fastest growing demographics in the country, 90 plus, because people are living longer. So get used to it. No longer are you old at 60s and the 70s. Uh, you know, now they're calling uh, 80s. That's the old, old. But before that, you're the young old. So take part, everybody. There's hope ahead. Thank you. I, I would prefer to be the no old, but I, I'll, I'll, take that. I'll take that. Um, I thank you, Dr. Baker, for we, we do want to pay tribute to that original set of presidents, 
led by Elder McCoy. Um, I wish I could remember some of uh, Roy Brown and who are some of those other guys? Peter Wright. Billy Wright. Miles, Norman Miles. Yeah, Norman, Norman Miles. Miles. We, we want to pay tribute to, to those guys um, because um, they, 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 did, they did take some heat. Um, and um, th some of them, in fact, most of them, I shouldn't, uh, some, let me put it this way, some of them did not go as far as they would have gone beyond conference president if because of the regional conference right. You're uh, right. retirement plan. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. I was preaching in a state conference church, um, not too um, not not very long after the regional conference retirement plan started. And the, the Caucasian pastor said to me, he said, I believe that Joseph McCoy would have been the president of the union if it were not for the regional conference retirement plan. Wow. I, I never I never will I never will forget that. I know I never will forget that. And I remember a conversation I had with Elder McCoy uh, where he said this. I, he said to me, he said, I know that there will be some opportunities denied me because of my stand. But I'm going to take that stand. And so we, we pay tribute to all those guys right. who right. have made who, who made sacrifices to make the lives of our workers better. All right, um, let's, Dr. Cox, let's close. Let's close because we're out of time. Uh, Dr. Cox, so you have the few, let, let's give you the final two questions. The ultimate goal for RCRP is full, to be fully funded. First of all, explain what that means and then explain what that potentially means for ministry in the regional conferences. Okay. So being fully funded means that we have enough assets to cover all of the liabilities of our workers, okay? And that is a moving target. And when I say that, I mean, because every year additional um, liabilities are going to accrue. Now, um, once we get to quote unquote fully funded, then um, those who are doing the actuarial studies will be able to um, say uh, to uh, our retirement board, uh, instead of putting, I'm just making up a figure, instead of putting $15 million uh, dollars into retirement, uh, you can put seven and the actuarials will maintain the idea that you are fully uh, funded. Once those funds are not, and this is a year to year target because it's, it's a moving target. Once we become fully funded, then those additional funds can go into the work of what we are primarily called uh, to do which is to evangelize and to uh, share the good news of the gospel. We do that in our individual conferences. We also have a commitment to uh, finishing the work in our collective uh, conferences. So once we are fully funded, then uh, on a year to year basis, actuarial studies will tell us what we need to put in as conferences to main, maintain the viability of all of our uh, retirees. And those additional funds can then be used by the conferences individually and collectively to do things to increase um, the financial support in sharing the gospel. So for example, um, when Mrs. Yvonne was in Lake Region um, and doing 10% of about $12 million tied. So that was one, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 or so. So if, if we no longer had to do 10.25 and we could cut that in half, then Lake Region would have another five, $600,000 to do ministry or we could, 
or or maybe they wouldn't keep all of it. Maybe they would keep some of it and then co- put the all the conferences would have a kind of collective pot where we could do collective things um, in terms of ministry, education, evangelism, whatever. Uh, we could we could have those extra funds uh, for ministry once we get fully funded. That, that's what you're saying. That that was the idea when the retirement program was initially uh, started. As I've had an opportunity, of course, to talk to Elder McCoy and to other legacy uh, presidents, and we identified legacy presidents as those who actually signed the documents to. Um, uh, initiate the regional conference retirement plan. That was the plan and the mindset of the leaders of that day. And we continue to share that with the leaders of our day so that it doesn't get lost you know, all over time. Uh, that would be the intent that we would seek to uh, carry out um, as we move towards being fully funded. All right. That my thanks to all of you. We've only uh, there's a question or two in the chat that we're not going to be able to get to because of time. Um, we've got one more question for Dr. Cox, and then we'll close. Thank you, um, Elder Edmund. Dr. Cox, at, we've covered so many things, and as a as an employee, I've learned, and I'm very excited. Is there anything that we did not cover that you feel that you would like to address before we close? Um, the, the principle that we follow in, in leadership in the retirement plan is twofold. Number one, we are, everything we do has to be beneficial to the retirees. We exist to address the needs of our retirees and every opportunity we have to follow best practices, regardless to what uh, it may change in terms of what we have done in the past, we are going to want to move in that direction. Um, The the first 10 years of our organization, we were seeking to build infrastructure. The second 10 years of our organization, we wanted to Uh, continue to build uh, our infrastructure and improve our ability to meet the needs of our retirees. This third phase that we are in right now, we are auditing what are the best practices that we are following right now. And we are committed uh, not to allow the words, we never did it like this before, to uh, stop us from doing that which is best for our um, our retirees. And that is that is the direction that we are going in. We believe that uh, God is, is leading. Uh, we have uh, great support on our board for this philosophy. And um, by the grace of God, we will move forward and occupy till he comes, providing individuals with more than a check. Okay, um, our producer is is kind of fussing at me, saying there's questions in the chat. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll take a couple of those. This one, uh, Floyd, have an important question. Though. Okay. The, um, okay. So, um, Miss Yvonne, you're seeing that question because I'm not seeing it. Elaine, can you see that clearly? Oh, she's gone. Um, just a moment. The question is. I might, what about I, those? I, who, okay. Go I, was, I can read it if you need. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's on there. Okay. 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 Go ahead, uh, Ms. Campbell. Go ahead and read that for us, please. What about those who paid to have their spouse receive 100% and took a lower percentage? Since the spouses received this automatically now, can we receive that percentage? Dr. Cox. Okay, the idea of 100%, um, the clarity of that was when a person was an active worker, they were actively working, they had not retired yet. That active worker, um, 
they died, their spouse would receive 66 and two thirds percent of their deceased uh, husband or wife. We have, we took a vote that uh, actuarially we can go back to January 1 of 2016 and say individuals as we go forward will get 100% versus 66 and two thirds percent. We were not able to go back beyond August 1, I mean, January 1 of 2016. So that was both voted by our board. So if you had a spouse who was actively working and they died in service as of, of January 1, 2016, you have been receiving 66 and two thirds percent. Uh, we are now going to increase that benefit from 66 and two thirds to 100%. Um, percent. So that's, that's what that is doing. Now, the flip side of that is if you are retired and you have taken a reduction in uh, the amount of money you are getting and your because of your spouse, um, you wanted your spouse to receive this. Once you sign those documents, that is etched in stone. So no matter what, that cannot change. So as an example, if your spouse uh, dies before you, your um, benefit still remains the same. And when you pass, it's over. And so it, it becomes important that individuals understand what that 100% actually is. Um, the final explanation on a 100% would be um, when uh, the employee signed up for retirement, um, they identified who would be the beneficiary of their retirement. So let's say a pastor signs up and says, I want my wife to receive 100% of my benefit. That does not mean you're going to get 100% of their benefit. It means that you will get 100% of what they choose when they retire for you. All right, when they retire, whatever they identified in those legal documents you will get 100% of what they have allotted. That's okay. the other way 100% is looked at. Okay, because it's still Sabbath. I don't want to get too deep into the front, into the weeds on that. Um, on, so let's, uh, let's, uh, now I don't know, I don't know if there are any more chat questions that don't cause us to kind of move into the front, to the, to the to the financial end of things um so if there's a if there's a if there's okay okay that's a good that's a good question um well we can that's that's a non going to the weeds question all right <laughs> could a current state conference declare themselves a regional conference and join the regional re retirement plan first of all understand that Contrary to what a lot of people think, a regional conference is not is not technic does not technically mean a black conference. A regional conference re refers to territory and not ethnicity. Okay, so so tech so technically a state con there there are there are state conferences that are already regional conferences. So could a state conference declare themselves, if they could, if they say, okay, we're technically we're a regional conference. We're Louisiana, Arkansas. We're Kansas, Nebraska. We're Kentucky 10. We're a regional conference. We want to join your retirement plan. How, how would that work, Dr. Fox? Okay. 
Um, the board would have to uh, decide that, uh, quite honestly, um, if we're looking at the funding elements, um, it would be better for if this was going to be something allowed by the North American division, uh, I, I have to make this caveat. Uh, there were conferences that wanted to join the regional conferences, and we were open to that in the beginning. Um, the North American division was not in support of that taking um, place. So resources were given to those conferences to assist them from not joining in to the regional conference uh, retirement plan. As it stands right now, it would probably be um, cost prohibitive for a conference to join us at this point. Uh, what we have looked at is whether or not other uh, conferences would want to join together and follow the roadmap that we have uh, left uh, behind to start their, their own uh, retirement uh, plan. Whether or not the North American division would go for that, I don't know. Uh, there is still, um, I, I was at the called meeting, there is still about uh, $800 million that is owed to that deficit that the North American division um, had. And so the concern would be not taking additional funds uh, away by moving conferences uh, into another defined benefit uh, program. So in other words, Dr. Cox, if, if I'm regional, if I'm state conference X and I want to join now, I would have to pay, I would have to in essence catch up for all the years that the, the program wasn't existent that I wasn't paying. It. So I'd have to write a really large check. Okay. Well, what would have to be done, there would have to be an actuarial study to see what kind of finances would be involved. And they would have to be a date certain uh, identified. So date certain for us was January 1, 2000. Um, those conferences would have to uh, identify when their program would uh, start, whether they would start January 1 of 2023, or say we are going to go back to January 1, um, 2020. All of those numbers would have to be put into the actuarial study to get a financial buy-in situation. I think it's interesting, and we do have to, we do need to close. But I do think it's interesting, and it's a, it is a it is a um, credit to the people who came before us that we have something that uh, our state conference brethren want. I mean, I was just, I don't want to say I was just because I might give it away, but I was in a state conference recently uh, with, where, uh, where um, you know, I got I, one of the pastors pulled me aside and said, listen, um, are you interested in engaging our leaders um, so, it's in, in, so that we can be a part of the regional conference retirement. Well, first of all, that's Dr. Cox area, not mine. But um, I'm, I mean, that is not that is not by any stretch of imagination the first time somebody from a state conference has said, "How can we how can we be a part of what you have?" And there is no regional conference plan without regional conferences, uh, and the ability for us to control our own resources. Um, and that's critical. All right, I, we gotta go, but um, Mrs. Mrs. Yvonne, you reference uh, what we do when, our, when a retiree dies. I do want Dr. Cox to, to what, what's, so I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, on a, I'm on the regional conference plan, I pass away. 
what what steps do you take from your office? Okay, the first thing that happens is uh, Elaine um, will uh, make me aware of someone that has passed and someone from our office will give a personal uh, phone call to the family. Generally, that's uh, me. Um, we contact the family. We offer uh, condolences. We let them know that there is a uh, letter that we are sending out. That letter is a letter of condolences. It also gives the seven steps that one will need to uh, go through in order for the beneficiary to begin to receive funds. That generally takes up to about, um, well, it, it, you need to be prepared for a two month period of time where there are no funds coming into the house in reference to that in the death of that employee. And we, um, uh, once the death certificate um, has been um, finalized with Mutual of America, that's one of the steps. Uh, and they have calculated what the beneficiary is going to get. Then for the two months that they did not receive any funds, they receive those funds plus interest in a lump sum. And then the following month, they will get uh, what they would uh, will receive for whatever the period of time um, that beneficiary uh, benefit has been identified. We have also uh, started uh, sending a, a check uh, just some funds that will help assist with uh, uh, the final, um, uh, final expenses of the employee. This is just for the employee. It's not for the beneficiary. It's for the employee. And um, that is, is what we are doing with um, what that that's what uh, Elder Collins was referencing in her earlier statement. Well, thank you for explaining that, Dr. Cox. And a lot of those benefits are things that have been initiated under your leadership. And we thank you for your vision of more than just a check. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Collins, Mrs. Austin, Dr. Baker, for a very informative program. Thank you for your ministry and God bless you. All right. Um, how are we going to, let's, let's close off with some commercials. All right. We are very excited about some of the things that are coming up in the first Sabbath series. And I know that coming up on your screen, you'll see our very next program, which will be on August 20 um, at our normal time. And it will feature Adventist Faces in High Places, some of our uh, most recent officers who are elected or reelected in the general conference session. We have Elder Paul Douglas and Elder Maurice Valentine, who will be joining us. And then we are really excited because we're hitting the road and our next two First Sabbath series will be on location. The next one will be on September, following August, or August one in September 3rd, we will have a meeting live from the new ORCM building. You can see there, it's looking good. And then in October, we'll be at Pine Forge, I know we'll have a lot of people who are really excited about that. We'll be live from Pine Forge, from the historic Pine Forge Academy um, on October 1st. So we look forward to seeing you then. And then we are especially excited that our newest issue of Regional Voice is now available. You can go to our website and there you can check out the newest issue of the Regional Voice on our website. Uh, we covered the, the recent general conference session, among other um, 
prevalent issues and, and things that are happening around the regional conferences. So we encourage you to please go to our website and um, check out the newest. You can go to our website and then go to our publications and there you'll see our most recent issue. Okay, um, I wonder, brother, uh, Pastor Savoy, can we put that website on the screen, which I, which I didn't give to you, <laughs> but uh, there you go. Okay, thank you. He's just so good. Um, that is, oh no, okay, that's the regional, no, no, that's regionalretirement.org. Okay, we are AdventistRegionalMinistries.org. I don't know if you can, add, all lowercase, Adventist regional ministries.org um, um so i don't know if you if if you can put that up there yeah there you go um okay he did it so fast um um he forgot the e there <laughs> uh ministries um um so uh, he's he's gonna put that back yes very good so we're gonna leave that up for a little while you can go as mrs campbell said you can go um to our website and and when you when you when you look on the home page at the bottom on the right it'll say our publications you can click on free f r e e free uh you can get um the um adventist reach i'm sorry the regional voice and it comes out four times a year uh you'll get the summer edition um and you can go on right now um, again, our uh, thanks to um, our regional conference retirement plan staff um, for a very interesting program. Um, and we thank our constituents for making that program possible. Ms. Ms. Rebecca, can you pray to close for us, please? Of course. Let us pray. Dear loving Lord and Father, we thank you so much for your kindness toward us. We thank you for giving your leaders the vision to ensure that your workers are able to retire with dignity. We pray that you will be with us as we close out your Sabbath and that we will lead others to you during this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, we thank you for your joining us for our first Sabbath, which is held on the fourth Sabbath this time due to general conference and camp meeting. We'll be back on our regular schedule after our next program, which is African American Adventist in High Places. Uh, you saw uh, Paul Douglas, who is the first African American treasure in the history of the General Conference. And you also saw uh, the newest uh, uh, General Conference Administrator, uh, uh, African American Elder Maurice Valentine. They'll be with us on August the 20th, and then we'll rotate back to our regular time, the first Sabbath of every month. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Campbell, Ms. Mrs. Campbell, Ms. Jackson, for these two ladies. I'm Elder Edmund. Thank you for joining us. Good night.